Hi, everybody. This is Elizabeth Wilson. I'm director of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society and professor in environmental studies. And I am thrilled today to have Josh Pearson from EDF Renewables um, talking to us about renewable energy project finance basics. As you all know, we have the Investing in Our Energy Futures workshop coming up in a few weeks. And we're trying to use these Dartmouth Energy Collaborative Lunch Series, that's us at the Irving Institute, the Revers Center for Energy at Tuck, the Sustainability Office, and the Thayer School of Engineering to really provide some additional material, background and reference material to help to contextualize and understand um, some of the finance topics going forward. And I couldn't be more thrilled than to have Josh, who's Vice President of Legal and Associate General Counsel for EDF Renewables, based in Houston. Um, and EDF Renewables is a renewables company which develops, constructs, and is a long-term owner and operator of wind and solar electricity generation and storage projects. His day-to-day -day responsibilities include negotiating, drafting, and critical review of merger and acquisition transactions, power and environmental attribute offtakes, derivatives and transactions, permitting and environmental matters, interconnection and transmission agreements. He also procures equipment and uh, oversees project construction contracts, debt and tax equity financings, as well as operations maintenance and asset management agreements. He spent eight years working at two nationally recognized law firms before joining EDF Renewables in 2009. And one of the reasons I think it's so important to have this perspective from somebody in the field is I know so many of our students are really interested in energy and energy finance, but having a, a perspective um, and someone who can help us understand the different players, how he makes decisions and how he thinks about things will be incredibly useful for all of us as we go forward um, into more and different conversations. So I'm going to turn my screen off. Um, Josh is going to give his presentation. Please feel free to type questions in the Q&A box below. And um, we will take a, a, a question and answer period in about 25 minutes. As a teaser, Josh is also, as I mentioned, based in Houston and has lived through the Texas uh, uh, outages and, and has, is working hard on a lot of those issues there. So if you have any Texas questions, now is a great time to ask them from someone there. So Josh, welcome. We're really thrilled to have you here and um, I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you, Elizabeth. So let me ensure that I am sharing my screen properly. Bear with me just a minute. So. I thought it would be useful to start with a, a little bit of contextualization for um, what I intend to talk about today. And that is um, uh, partly because the, the term renewable energy and renewable projects is, is really a vast universe ever expanding. Um, and there are many different uh, nascent technologies which and deployments of existing technologies that um, certainly may have and, and hopefully will have a significant impact going forward. But a lot of them are not um, uh, in uh, being deployed uh, effectively um, on a real-time basis in the same way that utility-scale um, onshore wind and solar projects are. Um, so this is partly based on my experience um, over the last 12 years or so working for a renewable company. Most of my experience is, is onshore wind and solar. So that those particular types of um, technologies and their, um, their, their construction and financing in the United States is gonna be the, the, the primary um, crux of our discussion. Um, by necessity, I'm gonna be covering uh, a number of different subjects associated with the project life cycle and financing for these projects that um, is cursory and, and it's gonna be high level by necessity, just given the time constraints that we have. Um, there are uh, you know, a number of complexities that, that go into each and every project um, and that's true across the board, um, you know, whether you're talking about renewables or other technologies. And so uh, we're happy to dive into some of those um, more nuanced details in the Q&A section if, if people so desire. Uh, the same is true for what I'm going to say about project finance. So financing renewables, renewables projects has many uh, of the same components and considerations that apply to conventional um, power generation resource financings. There are some um, unique variables associated with wind and solar projects in particular, and I'm going to try and highlight those for you um, as we go along. The last thing uh, I want to mention before we begin is that I'm going to, you, you'll hear me using the terms developer or sponsor or generator. 
uh, at different points during the discussion. And those are all essentially the same. Uh, I'm gonna use those interchangeably is probably the, the best way to put it. So that said, um, the other reason that I'm focused on onshore wind and solar is because um, they're proven technologies. They've been around for decades um, and they have widespread deployment um, uh, and, and actual operation in the field today. That's a very important aspect of um, any sort of financing that uh, needs to be considered. And one of the reasons so much new investment has gone into those types of resources over the last um, 10 years in particular. Um, uh, lenders and financing parties do not, uh, they're risk averse. They do not like to invest their money into um, unproven technologies and um, wind and solar electricity generation uh, on a relative basis is, is, is simple compared to a lot of other uh, generation resources. These projects um, can be fairly quickly deployed um, over the course of, in some cases, nine months um, for some solar projects to um, two years for certain, certain wind projects. Um, so the world uh, as a whole, um, insofar as they're focused on renewables, they're focusing uh, you know, to a large extent on wind and solar. The chart in front of you is, uh, I thought I would uh, provide just to show you, give you a, a flavor for the amount of um, investment that's going into new renewables projects. This uh, graphic uh, runs uh, through the first half of 2020. And what you'll see there is um, the, the blue represents new wind capacity, the yellow or orange um, is new solar capacity, roughly, um, $300 billion a year in new investment um, has been uh, put into these resources over the last 10 years. This is globally, um, but nevertheless, it's a significant amount of, of capital that's being deployed. And, um, and, and there's no reason, uh, frankly, that I've seen uh, no estimates in terms of future uh, capacity growth to suggest that, that, that uh, a reversal in that trend. Um, a few other reasons that I think are worthy of note uh, in terms of why we're talking about renewables today. Um, there's been significant new or renewed um, or, and consistent media attention given to renewables over the last several years. The, the, the Paris Climate Accord, uh, I think, was a recognition on, a, on a, again, a global level uh, that, that many countries in the world, um, they perceive climate change and um, reduction of, uh, of, of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions is uh, a, a large goal, an important uh, sociological societal goal that, um, that should be pursued. And these capital deployments, I think, are, are a re reflection of that. Um, you're also, uh, you may have seen recently, um, um, President Biden here in the US uh, released an infrastructure uh, plan that he would like implemented um, over the ensuing um, uh, eight to 10 years. That would be, uh, he nominally, uh, he proposed a $2 trillion investment. Um, so a lot of those, the, the, there are a lot of disparate um, um, uh, contributing factors that are um, keeping renewables investments and, and new um, renewables capacity growth in, uh, in the forefront of many people's minds. In terms of um, sort of high level, what I'll call drivers or, or um, uh, motivations that have expanded and continue to expand uh, renewables in the US, one that does not get a, a great deal of attention is something called renewable portfolio standards. These are um, state level standards passed typically uh, under state legislation that mandate that utilities that operate within the state that passes this RPS have to generate a specified percentage of their electricity um, from renewable resources by a date certain in the future. Um, some of those, those standards um, require compliance over you know, the course of five, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. Um, but that, at least historically, going back, say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 
most of um, the new renewable generation that was being constructed in the US was being built primarily to comply with these, these portfolio standards. Um, it was not economically viable 10 or 15 years ago to build a wind or solar project um, in the same way that you could build a new nuclear facility or a new, uh, in particular, natural gas um, or coal facility. So much of the historical driver for renewables in the US were these renewable portfolio standards. That has changed significantly. One of the big reasons is the precipitous decline in the cost of building wind and solar projects in the US. Um, the, the, the costs have come down largely due, uh, due to economies of scale, efficiencies in the output of wind turbines and the conversion of, um, of, of sunlight to electricity um, via increased um, uh, panel efficiencies have brought those costs for those types of um, renewables products down to a point now where they are effectively competing with natural gas, if not beating natural gas on price uh, in, 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 in most, of, uh, uh, most of the parts of the US. Um, also beginning around 10 years ago, we started seeing the emergence of what we in the industry call commercial and industrial or CNI customers. These are non-traditional um, buyers of uh, the power and other attributes that renewable projects um, generate. And um, I'll go into a little more detail about the, the, the CNI business a, as it goes on, but these are effectively corporate players. So um, many of them technology companies um, who have, for example, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, uh, in addition to you know some uh, more more um, 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 more typical uh, manufacturing um, operators like uh, Procter and Gamble, for example, they have uh, set sustainability goals not because of any sort of legal mandate or or law that requires them to do so, but as a uh, internal corporate um, goal and in an, and uh, as a marketing tool, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, so that they can go out to their retail customers and say, hey, yes, you know, our facilities consume uh, a significant amount of power. Uh, our data centers utilize a lot of electricity, but we are going out and procuring through, um, through, our, um, uh, through different renewal developers and sponsors, um, green power to offset the environmental impact of those uh, data centers, for example. So that, that's been a big driver um, over the last 10 years and, and will continue to be so. Federal tax credits is another um, very significant um, topic of discussion. I will go into uh, more detail on that, on the tax credits and, uh, and monetization and financing of those credits momentarily. Um, transmission infrastructure is very important for renewables. Most renewables projects, wind and solar in particular, um, are constructed in um, rural areas, so um, <clears throat> particularly large scale projects require a lot of uh, physical land to construct. Um, a utility scale uh, wind project could very frequently utilizes uh, somewhere between uh, 10,000 and 40,000 acres. Uh, so understandably in order to find that, um, that land mass, you have to get out into the country um, but the further away you are from the load, effectively the demand for the power um, that, is, that is to be generated from that facility, the more um, uh, limited you are in terms of getting the power from your facility out of the location where you're creating it and into the metropolitan areas and, and other um, uh, predominantly, you know, big, bigger cities where that power uh, could actually be consumed. So the more investment that's put into um, transmission and allowing for the fr fr freer flow of electrons um, certainly would drive additional investment in, in renewables and, and help um, with things like grid stability and um, generation, uh, other resource, other generation resources as well. 
Um, trade policy and tariff have an impact on renewables and many other industries, but in particular, um, most of the wind turbines that are manufactured uh, and deployed uh, in the US, they're, they're actually uh, built predominantly overseas. So um, most of the wind turbines are, are generated, uh, sorry, produced somewhere in, uh, in Europe uh, for the most part. Uh, much of the solar panels that are uh, deployed here in the US are manufactured in Asia. And so um, when you're talking about steel tariffs or uh, tariffs on, on uh, products from China, um, that creates incremental cost, of course. Um, when you purchase those and deploy them in the U.S., and uh, um, and those 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 costs in turn drive up the the, the price um, that's needed to pay for that um, that new resource and and ultimately the cost of the energy it produces. Um, FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, has um, jurisdictional oversight over all um, interstate transmission of electricity in the U.S. Um, they, from a policy uh, perspective, because they oversee um, uh, elect organized elect electricity markets, the different um, policies that they adopt or, or could promulgate certainly could have um, disparate, uh, either positive or negative impacts on um, different generation resources. So it's a, it's a complicated and nuanced area, but I mention it only because uh, if you continue to pursue an interest in, uh, in electricity markets or renewables in particular, it's a, it's a topic that you, you will see um, arising again and again in, in multiple contexts. I've listed here, uh, again, a I alluded, uh, um, I alluded earlier to the fact that I'm focused on um, utility <clears throat> scale wind, onshore wind and solar, but I, I would be remiss not to mention some of these other resources as well, these other renewables um, opportunities, which each individually are not necessarily, um, you know, having the order of magnitude impact that onshore wind and solar is having in terms of, um, in terms of you know, projects that are currently be, being constructed or, or envisioned over the next uh, uh, near term, several years. But over the longer term and in aggregate, these other renewables resources certainly will be a driver for renewable expansion in the US. And, and as I said, I can, I can speak to more particulars on any of those subjects um, in the Q&A. Finally, I listed here a carbon tax or a cap and trade program. These tend to be um, not well supported um, legislatively at the federal level. Um, so either one of those program types of programs uh, would have a very profound impact in terms of um, um, uh, uh, opportunities for, for building out a more um, renewable generation. Um, they don't seem like a political uh, reality, again, at the federal level currently, but that could certainly change uh, over time. It's interesting uh, to me to note that as part of um, President Biden's infrastructure plan, he did not include any sort of reference to a carbon tax or a cap and trade program, although they have been uh, deployed in, in certain states within the U.S. So now um, I wanted to walk you through the way that I think about um, individual projects that we that we work on, and the sequence, uh, sort of the sequencing and, and inputs into um, uh, those projects, and and determining their their viability and uh, how best to construct them, and and implications in terms of long term ownership. So there's three phases that are reflected here in blue. And again, this is just the way that I like to think of um, the way the, the, the way one of these renewable projects breaks down um, from a work standpoint. The first phase is development and feasibility. Do I, can I actually cobble together uh, the, the foundational components of a project in a way um, where um, it, it will be ultimately financeable, it will be at a cost, to a, an ultimate purchaser of the power and the other after attributes that I'm um, 
that I'm uh, going to generate that that is achievable. In other words, there will be a an interested buyer at the price I'm offering. Um, will it be financeable? Um, whatever sort of financing I'm seeking, and I'll, I'll delve into those uh, momentarily. Um, what are the considerations around construction? Um, whose wind turbines or solar panels am I buying? Um, what are the operational characteristics of those turbines? How do those things um, comport with the location that I'm choosing for my project? Um, all interrelated uh, questions that have to be considered um, uh, you know, largely simultaneously. So, so one other note before I progress, I am depicting here in these yellow boxes under the feasibility phase, this sort of sequential uh, move from land control to permitting, design, interconnection. In reality, um, all of these things are going on uh, largely simultaneously in early project development. Um, your, your primary concern, of course, uh, with any project that you're building is where am I going to put it? Um, land control is one of your foundational considerations and community support for the project you're trying to build um, um, is paramount. Um, most of these wind and solar projects um, operate under long-term leases with uh, the landowners. And um, part of the um, um, you know determining the viability of your project is of course what sort of lease rates you're going to pay to those landowners. Um, that uh, that of course is going to inform the support that you get from the community because if you have landowners who are excited about um, you building the project there, they will be able to influence other people in the community to similarly support the project. Um, your location, your project location has a direct impact on your energy estimates. So depending on um, how frequently and how strongly the wind blows or how, um, how sunny it is in the particular location um, for your project, that is gonna directly translate into the amount of, of power that you're expecting to produce. Um, Wind and solar are, of course, they're variable resources. Um, that's one of the, the, the things that, uh, one of the biggest uh, gaps, I think, from many people's um, impression about renewables is that, that they're, they're unreliable. Um, there's no question that those resources are variable uh, and something like um, uh, developments in battery storage technology is going to uh, uh, no doubt help bridge that gap. Over the long term, energy output in terms of the wind and solar um, capabilities of a project is fairly predictable, but of course in the short term it's variable. Um, part and parcel of that community support that you're trying to garner leads you to permitting considerations. Almost every project um, uh, will have some sort of um, county level permitting, um, unless you're in Texas. Um, it's one of the few states where you don't really deal with uh, site permits in the same way you do in the rest of the country, but um, almost anywhere else in the US, you're looking at, they typically are called conditional use permits. So again, you're looking for that community support. You want the county board members um, to be aligned behind your project. And this is really where a lot of consideration begins in terms of cost and timing for your project. So the permit that you're seeking and the timeline in which you hope to obtain it is going to be a critical component as you move through these other aspects of the feasibility phase for your project. Um, per, somewhat tangential to permitting, but also relevant are things like um, uh, environmental site assessments. So for example, are there uh, some sort of hazardous waste or pollution uh, effects um, or in the in the land control area for the project that need to be taken into account. They also could include uh, other environmental impacts such as to um, threatened or endangered species or habitats. Um, if you build a project without properly accounting for uh, a, a protected golden eagle, for example, uh, or a California condor or uh, a desert uh, California desert tortoise, and you end up 
injuring one of those um, one of those protected species or their habitat, you could have the federal government effectively shut your project down. So you want to be out in front of those considerations, thinking about that in advance. So while your land control and permitting is going on, you're starting the the area of your project begins to take shape. <clears throat> Now you're starting to think about the actual design of that facility uh, from a, from an electrical and and a civil you know structural standpoint. You are also beginning to think about interconnection, which is essentially how you are going to get the electrons that are generated by your project connected to the existing uh, electric grid. Um, that ties back in many ways to the land control uh, and siting uh, discussion because interconnection costs, in other words, building a new transmission line to get power from a sponsor's um, generating facility <clears throat> to the existing electrical grid uh, oftentimes can be north of a million dollars a mile. So, you know, a, fi a, a project that uh, is 50 miles away from the existing grid is going to have an, uh, an ex uh, a huge uh, extra cost associated with that new um, interconnection. And so the closer you can get your project to the existing grid, the, the more, um, you know, the less cost you're facing. Part of the interconnection process involves grid studies. Um, those look at, in terms of the, the, the actual grid operator and the owner of the transmission lines that you're trying to interconnect to, what impact is your new facility going to have on the stability of the grid in the area where you're, you're interconnecting? Um, there will be studies around um, uh, actual um, construction that needs to be done at the, at the location in the grid where your project is interconnecting. And um, depending on, again, some of those stability uh, considerations, there may need to be other upgrades to the existing grid to enable the full output of your new project uh, to be utilized uh, on, the, on the larger grid, the larger system. Um, there again, timing becomes an issue because if upgrades need to be constru constructed, um, you need some, you're looking for certainty in terms of um, uh, not just the cost, but when those upgrades will be available uh, and how that lines up with when you're actually intending to start delivering electricity from your project. Those um, four elements, as they begin to take shape in a typically a, a preliminary uh, or intermediate fashion. So in other words, you're still working on all these items. You are beginning to think about what is really the most critical component of any renewable wind and solar project, which is your power purchase agreement. And this agreement um, can take several different forms uh, that I'll speak about momentarily. But this is your primary revenue generator for your project. It's um, without a power purchase agreement or offtake agreement, as they're sometimes um, called, you will have a very hard time finding any sort of construction financing or tax equity financing for your project. So the terms, the existence of that contract um, it, it, it can't be, uh, the importance can't be overstated. Again, the conversation around the power purchase agreement is largely driven by who the buyer of the power is going to be uh, and at what price. So as you're thinking about these costs for land control, for permitting, for interconnection, and then you start to reach out to um, suppliers of the wind turbines or solar panels that you're looking to construct and actual construction companies who will put that equipment together for you, you're getting cost estimates from these um, um, suppliers and contractors. You're taking into account the other construction and long-term operating costs for the project, and you're arriving at a price that you can offer to a, a buyer of the power. And um, without the right price and the right customer, and the right timeline for your project in terms of when you expect to reach commercial operation for the project and um, what sort of production profile the project will have, 
what sort of assurances you can give your, your, your PPA or off-taker buyer about the amount of electricity to be produced. All of those things are, are really um, going to drive whether or not your project actually will ever be built effectively. So <clears throat> just a few words on a few types of financing that are worthy of consideration. I listed here equity slash working capital financing um, as something that some developers will seek during the development phase of a project. There's not a great deal of discussion around um, you know, er, what I'll call early stage equity financing for most um, uh, wind and solar projects that are built in the US. A smaller developer, um, maybe not very well capitalized. So um, you know, it, it, it's a sort of a mom and pop operation. They come up with the idea for building a wind project. They get support from some of the local <clears throat> farmers or ranchers that live in their area. They can start to put together some of these basic building blocks for the project. But the costs on the, you know, in this development phase tend to be in the, uh, you know, in, in the millions to tens of millions of dollars, which is relatively small compared to the aggregate cost to, to build an entire project. So, uh, you know, a smaller developer might go out and seek what I think of as effectively sort of a, a venture capital financing. And there are venture capital investors who are dedicated to investing in, uh, in renewables projects. That may be one source of capital for the project, but um, uh, by and large, most of the projects that are built in the US today uh, are being built by developers and sponsors who are sufficiently capitalized that they don't need to rely on, on this sort of um, uh, early stage equity financing. Once you get to a point where, uh, again, your land control permitting, all these building blocks and your power purchase agreement are taking shape and um, you are advanced in your negotiations in terms of your suppliers and your construction contractor, you're then ready to start thinking, uh, you've been thinking about this already for quite some time and probably negotiating it already, but you may see construction financing. Um, there are banks uh, around the world that focus on um, lending, construction lending for renewables projects. They are very sophisticated about the different pitfalls and, uh, uh, and due diligence items that they will want to focus on before they're willing to lend funds to construct your project. So they will want to assess all of these project inputs and the terms associated with um, the supply and construction of the projects to ensure that um, they have, have, you know, are as they've been de-risked effectively to the maximum extent possible. And uh, to the extent there are any risks that the sponsor is bearing, that the, the sponsor in fact has the financial wherewithal to nevertheless um, see the project through. So construction cost overruns, for example, they will be expecting the sponsor to scoop up, you know, sort of clean up whatever mess uh, may have arisen um, unexpectedly during construction to, to see the project to fruition. Um, construction lenders will take a, a project lien, they'll take a lien on the project assets as collateral in the event um, something goes wrong and, uh, and the sponsor's unable to repay the construction loan. There are a ton of third parties that are involved in a, a construction loan. They, they vary from insurance consultants, of course, uh, uh, lawyers helping negotiate the loan uh, conditions, providing legal opinions. Um, there are environmental um, consultants, a lot of third party uh, subject matter experts being brought to bear through what for these lenders is a, you know, a, a pretty prototypical um, underwriting process that they undertake. Once you've got your construction financing in place, then you get to uh, what, what the industry term for most capital intensive project, uh, you know, large infrastructure projects, you get to what, your, uh, what, what is referred to in your construction and supply contracts as a notice to proceed. That is the point at which you are effectively telling your suppliers and your contractors, I'm ready 
to go build the project based on the agreed schedule and timelines that we've negotiated. So please go do everything that you need to do. Spend whatever money you need to to, to manufacture um, what I'm buying you or actually put people into the field to, to uh, do the civil work, uh, um, the roads, pouring foundations, um, you, you name it. The notice to proceed is sort of the point of no return effectively in terms of what you're expected to, to do to, to, to bring the project to um, fruition. Tax equity financing, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about in a moment. It's this, uh, in my experience, tax equity financing is unique to the renewables industry in the US. Um, again, primarily wind and solar. Uh, a lot of the underwriting that goes on from a tax equity perspective is similar to a construction lender, but um, the tax equity investor is very focused on the potential tax attributes that will flow from the project. And, um, and I'll, just, I'll, I'll get into a little more detail on those tax attributes in a moment. When you get to commercial operation, now your facility is fully constructed, you're ready to deliver electrons on a regular basis. What usually happens with your construction debt is your tax equity financing will fund around the time of commercial operation. So you'll get the money from that tax equity financing. You'll use those funds to pay down your construction debt. And then you will convert the remainder of that debt um, to a long-term uh, uh, lending facility, essentially. Um, the term of that term debt will roughly coincide with the length of your power purchase agreement. Um, and it, it, it is effectively, a, you know, it's a way to use borrowed money to um, help maximize the sponsor's returns. So that's a high level overview on uh, the project life cycle. Again, we're gonna revisit a few of these topics in more detail. In terms of, and you know, each individual renewable project, each wind and solar project that a sponsor is contemplating construction, uh, constructing. Again, the, the most critical drivers economically are these offtake agreements, these power purchase agreements. Um, the federal tax credits, they're called ITCs, uh, investment tax credits for solar projects and production tax credits for wind projects. Uh, again, I'll get into more detail about those in a moment. Uh, renewable energy credits is another um, at, you know, attribute, financial attribute effectively that is created by renewables projects. So for each megawatt hour of electricity that is generated from a wind and solar project, um, a renewable energy credit is created um, along with that electricity. The, these RECs are, um, they are, uh, can be separated from the, the electricity that creates them and they can be separately sold. Uh, there are various markets around the country where they, these credits are traded and retraded. Um, the value of these credits is derived largely from um, uh, those who wanna demonstrate that they have paid value, they've effectively contributed um, through a purchase of those RECs to the generation of power from a renewable facility. Uh, most important for, um, for, for most CNI customers, for example, is the, the RECs that they are purchasing from uh, a wind and solar generation project. And, and I'll explain that uh, in slightly more detail as we get down to uh, talk more about these sponsor agreements or offtake agreements. There are other, uh, other what are known as ancillary services that can also create some, um, some financial benefit to sponsors. Um, there, in some states, there are state tax credits as opposed to federal um, that a sponsor can benefit from, tax abatements, uh, but th all of these other items from a pure financial impact perspective are relatively small compared to the offtake agreement and the, and the federal tax credits. So now in, in terms of these different offtake agreements and the types of offtake agreements that um, that are available for uh, or available to um, a renewable generator. Uh, 10 years ago, almost all these power purchase agreements were 
what we call bus bar PPAs. Effectively, it was a uh, sale of power from the project and, and RECs to a, a traditional utility buyer. That utility would acquire those electrons once they um, hit, the, hit the grid um, effectively. They were long-term fixed, uh, fixed price contracts. Um, they were, were and continue to be a very attractive um, revenue generation resource for renewables projects, but they, um, uh, we're seeing less and less of these in the marketplace uh, as, as PPA buyers become more, uh, more sophisticated, they demand uh, more exacting terms in their power purchase agreements. And so while occasionally you still will see uh, some of these long-term fixed price power purchase agreements, you're also seeing you know, many other variable, um, more, uh, many other offtake arrangements with much more variability in terms of the revenue certainty that they offer. And so one example um, are these virtual PPAs, um, again, for primarily for commercial and industrial customers. 10 years ago, you really never heard or saw commercial customers um, looking to procure or enter into one of these virtual PPAs uh, with the renewable um, generator. What is enabled, uh, it's the precise structure of these contracts that allows for that interaction between a commercial customer and a renewable generator. And that um, in particular ties to the fact that these are financial contracts. So they are not a purchase of the physical electricity or electrons that are generated um, by the sponsor but rather they are a what we call a fixed for floating financial settlement contract. Um, and without getting into too much complexity, effectively a PPA, a virtual PPA buyer, a corporate and industrial customer, agrees with a sponsor to pay a set dollar per megawatt, so a fixed price for the electricity that um, the sponsor generates. They don't but they don't actually buy the power. They're just paying a fixed dollar per megawatt price. Um, in exchange, the sponsor agrees that um, in the future, uh, if the price that the sponsor receives based on selling the actual electrons of the project into the market is higher than the fixed price that the PPA buyer is paying, then that overage, that excess, um, revenue goes back to the virtual PPA buyer. So it's a, it's a tool that effectively allows um, these commercial and, and industrial customers to create a ceiling on their, their going forward electricity prices um, when it, all the while um, they're actually procuring their electricity needs from their local utility. Uh, another uh, some, somewhat analogous um, um, uh, offtake agreement is a commodity hedge. Um, these uh, have some similarities to these, these virtual PPAs, uh, but they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Um, and they are much more like a traditional um, commodity hedge, effectively short term. Um, uh, and you're dealing in that case with um, energy trading counterparts. So uh, companies that are in, in the business of buying and reselling um, electricity for the most part and financial derivative products. So it's a, it's a slightly different um, product, but the commonality between a commodity hedge and a virtual PPA and a bus bar P PPA, what you're looking for is long-term reliable revenue streams um, that form the foundation of a, a financing investment decision by a, uh, 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 by a group of, um, of lenders that might be providing construction financing and similarly from a tax equity investor um, who's willing and, and considering investing in your project as, a, as an equity owner. So now a moment on uh, tax equity financings. Uh, most sponsors, most project developers um, for wind and solar projects do not have tax appetite. What that means is effectively, there are 
certain tax attributes that are generated by renewables projects. I mentioned these investment tax credits for solar, production tax credits for wind. There are also depreciation benefits uh, associated with the, 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 the components, the equipment that is installed. Most sponsors do not have sufficient taxable gains to be able to fully utilize the value of those tax attributes. So what has evolved over the last um, uh, a number of years, more than 10, 15 or 20 years, is um, a particular type of fi financing known as tax equity. So a third party investor who does have tax appetite, and these are traditionally, uh, imagine banks or insurance companies, very profitable institutions have uh, a desire to um, reduce or minimize their taxable gains. And they can do that by co-investing in these projects with a sponsor or developer, um, providing the sponsor or developer cash upfront in exchange for their equity investment. And then in return, receiving from the sponsor uh, the disproportionately large amount and value of the tax attributes that are associated with the project. Um, so it's a, a symbiotic investment uh, insofar as you get a tax equity investor who's, who's sort of maximizing their tax position. You've got a sponsor who has tax attributes that it cannot utilize. And, uh, and so they're turning, uh, turning those to um, uh, their own needs effectively to help finance future costs. These different tax credits, uh, uh, devol the, the particularities of each um, are, are um, very nuanced and very um, IRS uh, tax compliance driven. The, probably the biggest takeaway from this slide is that um, the, those existing credits are being phased out over the next several years um, under current law. However, part of President Biden's uh, infrastructure plan is a potential extension of those credits for, for I think he proposed 10 years into the future. It could be, um, could be longer or shorter. Um, the last slide I wanted to speak to quickly is, is um, this is from the uh, uh, Energy Information Administration, so the U.S. government effectively. These are, <laughs> so I will say the one consistent thing about projections is that they're wrong. Uh, maybe one way or the other. So, so uh, you know, there, these these outcomes could be uh, much greater or much smaller than projected. But here you see, as of 2020, renewables in green here is the is uh, represented 21 percent of the total generation mix in the U.S. Natural gas was at 40, and then uh, nuclear and coal, and that's projected by 2050 to increase to 42 percent for renewables. And then within that subset of renewables, you can see here that um, you know to a large extent you're looking at um, hydroelectric, uh, but most of the new generation here is coming from wind and and solar. Um, so lots of opportunities for growth. By the way, I have not seen anything. That I I don't I don't think these projections are reflective of uh, President Biden's infrastructure plan. I think they would look vastly different, of course, if that plan was, was implemented, but that will uh, uh, have to be determined, of course. Josh, this was just super. I'm gonna watch this video three or four more times and, and, and really try and understand some of the nuances that, that you've pulled out. And I have to say, I really appreciated your, your helping walk us through these different phases of the developer and understanding the roles of the sponsor and, and then the, um, the, the generator as you went through. Um, we have a couple of questions that were submitted before and a few in the queue, and let's go through them. Um, and one of the ones that I'm always interested in is within the United States, how does project financing strategy change between states? Um, are projects that span multiple states feasible? And I guess, what are some of the challenges? And I appreciated your, your play on the Texas and kind of the different you know, land control components and how that might vary, transmission access components and how that might vary. So if you could speak to just the different state by state, that would be wonderful. And in addition to that, just how that's changed over your career. 
because I realized that places that were easy at the beginning are impossible now and vice versa. That's right. So, so the state and even the county to county mm -hmm. vari variations that you see um, can create very different potential outcomes for a project. So by way of example, um, it's no, will come to as no surprise to anyone that um, a lot of people, uh, when they find out that a new wind generation facility is going to be built uh, in their county, and they find out that uh, you know the average height of each of those wind turbines is going to be somewhere between 350 and not quite 500 feet tall, and they moved, you know, it's a family homestead that they've owned for generations, or they moved to the area because they love the sunsets and the vistas. There are certainly places and and uh, and, and you know, as landowners, they're absolutely entitled to take these positions. There's some places that do not support new wind projects, right, uh, or, or solar projects. And one very effective way to deter new renewables generation is by doing things like um, getting a county board to pass um, permit requirements for, let, for example, wind projects that have um, very, agree uh, uh, I'm, I'm showing my bias here. I was about to say egregious, the, uh, significant setback requirements. So in other words, the turbine that you build cannot be located anywhere within, let's say 400 feet of, or 500 or 1,000 or 1,500 feet from any other existing structure, a dwelling, a road, anything. And ostensibly it's for, for safety reasons, right? The, the county says, hey, you know, we want to make sure if the turbine falls down, right, it's not going to kill anybody, it's not going to fall into traffic. And those are, are certainly, safety is our, our number one concern. Um, but what those requirements do in certain parts of the country is effectively, you, you can't build your project, you can't build anywhere um, and, and comply with those requirements. So, so certainly county to county, um, the, the viability of a project is highly dependent on, again, that community support. Um, different states, I think I alluded to the fact that there some states have um, state production credits that they offer, uh, tax credits, effectively. Those tend to be pretty nominal in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, so there's not a ton of variability in terms of, you know, can a project get or obtain financing if they're in California versus Texas. But the amount of underlying work that has to go in to make the project viable will vary significantly depending on which state and, and you know, local county and mun municipality where you're building. Transaction costs. No doubt. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because so often we think about the technology and the cost without taking into account the cost of those delays, the transaction costs within the permitting and siting and, and build prospects as well that from a developer's perspective can make or break a project, I'm sure. Absolutely, yes. Um, another question that we had here, these two actually fit together. One of the pre-submitted was, um, from, one was from David Perlman on, um, project finance for large energy projects began its life cycle in the 1980s when most project sponsored developers were entrepreneurs who had limited capital, limited tax credit deduction capacity. With the project sponsor world moving towards large companies such as EDF, how do you view the trade-off between the complexity, labor intensity, and high transaction costs associated with project financings versus using traditional corporate financing to fund new project construction? And something that you addressed before that I want to just link on to this is mm -hmm. the future of small 150 to 500 kilowatt, really mm -hmm. small, mm -hmm. um, community solar. Is it still viable in an era of utility solar? Let's make that up to one megawatt just to give us some more running room there. <laughs> sure, sure. So, so um, uh, to the earlier question, so financing, finan uh, there's no question that that not all financings are created equal. Right. And the, the, the cost of capital that is being utilized is gonna make a big difference in terms of whether or not um, uh, an, an individual sponsor actually thinks some forms of financing are, are worthwhile. Construction financing is a very good example. It tends to be very expensive. Um, 
So these, um, you know, these syndicated lenders, they take, they, uh, they look at these like they look at, you know, every other investment that they mm -hmm. make, they take, they take significant fees just for making the loans on the front end, right? Um, they charge, you know, fairly exorbitant interest rates. The other difficulty with construction financing is that you're financing before you are actually building anything while you're still working on putting together those building blocks for the project. Mm -hmm. So there, there are many more gaps that need to be filled before you are really can sort of look your lenders in the eye and convince them that this is, you know, you've de-risked the project uh, as much as possible. And they so it's higher risk. It's considered higher risk financing than in the construction phase. No question. And, and more expensive. So if you have the wherewithal, like, like um, you know, fortunately, EDF is in this position. We have not actually done construction financing for the last six or seven years, mm -hmm. um, just because of all those costs. Uh, it, it just hasn't made sense for us. Again, we're fortunate to have a balance sheet to, to allow us to do that. Um, tax equity is something that we still need that uh, I don't see, uh, well, We'll see what happens with tax equity uh, over the ensuing years. As I mentioned, um, many of those credits are phasing down over the next several years. Of course, if you see uh, if you see one an extension of those credits for the, for ten more years, and two, if you see, uh, for example, an, an increase in the corporate tax rate, which is also part of the president's infrastructure plan, well, then now you're the appetite right, of the investors goes up mm -hmm. and there's a longer period to build projects to take advantage of it. So that, that could have a, 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 a certainly an enhanced impact on the, the future for renewables over the ensuing years. No, and I, I appreciate that. I mean, Felix Mormon, who's a professor down at um, in, in Florida, was talking a lot about how it was essentially three banks with the tax appetite to kind of finance everything. And his point was that in about 30% of the production tax credit goes to these three big banks. And you know, it's so basically it's a finance subsidy sector was his kind of critique of the production tax credit. You're speaking but, about some very important partners of ours, Elizabeth. So uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm a professor. So, you know, I, I can say whatever nonsense I want. I, I can um, confirm that. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. And so one of the questions again from Jack Robinson, and I've got one from Catherine Weber as well, and then I'm gonna leave you with your big thoughts. But um, one was again, that cost of capital and, and how you adjust it for risk. And is that done in the pricing of the PPA? And yes. the other is something that you and I talked about a little bit before we came on screen. And that was kind of what the future developments and revenue streams will be. And Catherine Weber asked, do you think that ancillary services, particularly in forward capacity markets, but I think we can add all of the other ancillary services as well, mm -hmm. um, will become more important revenue streams in the future. For instance, there are several offshore wind installations being built that are as large power plant and could provide these services. I know within the European context, that's a big part of some of these offshore energy islands that, that they're talking about in the Baltic and North Sea. Sure, and capacity. So the biggest, and, and I'm not an expert, a capacity expert, and I, I have not delved into much of our offshore work, um, although as alluded, there's a lot of deployments going on uh, historically and, and coming online in, uh, in offshore Europe. But the problem that I see with capacity is um, when you're when you're when you are paying when you when a market is uh, is incentivizing capacity, what the market is counting on and the regulator you know the, the the system operator is counting on is that when it calls upon you to generate, you will be able to show up at that time. The complexity is the variability of mm -hmm. renewable generation. So there are places. Um, uh, the PGM market, for example, where all generators are, uh, you know, they must operate or contribute to certain aspects of their capacity markets, but it's not a great setup. What really solves or sort of bridges that gap in my mind is storage, mm -hmm. right? If you, can, mm -hmm. if you can couple storage with your variable resource, then yet, yeah, then now you, you do have uh, an, uh, a generator with capacity attributes you know, to be called upon when necessary. Um, so there, there's value there, but the ways in which these markets evolve and what they monetize and what they don't is so disparate uh, yeah. market yeah. to market. 
and it it changes constantly, uh, constantly. So, so this is my research. So I, you're, you're you're singing my song here. <laughs> well, yeah, it's my day to day. So yeah, yeah, trying to follow the the market evolutions is is uh, a full time job in and to itself. Yeah. So Josh, we're going to invite you back in five years and and check this next prediction. But if you could just put on your magic thinking hat here. And, and help us understand kind of where you see the horizon going in this space, where you see some of the big things that could flip conventional wisdom and where you see some of the big opportunities. Paint that picture for us. I think I would go back. So um, all of the, tax, the, the, the credits, the tax incentives, those sort of, 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 um, of dri you know, drivers is the expression I kept using are wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. And there's nobody in the in the renewables industry who 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 would you know who would wish those to go away. Um, but the fact of the matter is, the precipitous decline in the cost mm -hmm. of these resources is really sort of wiping away so many other considerations now. So such that you're seeing. Um, you don't even really have to talk to people. Uh, you know some traditional utilities. For example, as potential customers, you don't have to talk to them. They don't care about environmental benefits, CO2 reductions. They don't, what they care about is the lowest cost source of power for their customers. And that there has to be a bottom somewhere in terms of those cost reductions, but we've not seen it uh, yet. And, uh, and so I think you're just going to see a bigger, bigger market share for renewables going forward. And I, I don't, again, battery and storage is sort of the missing link that I think helps solve the, the grid stability puzzle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we'll see, uh, you know, two to three times the growth in, the, in solar deployments than in wind. Uh, again, because at, in the not too distant future, probably solar will become more inexpensive mm -hmm. than wind. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, the demise, I think, of conventional power is, is um, uh, maybe too, uh, too happily predicted by some in the renewables energy. I, I think we're going to see natural gas around for, for quite some time. But the bridge to an energy transition, I think, the foundation is being laid now. If, mm -hmm some form of uh, President Biden's plan passes, even if it's not nearly as ambitious as, as what was presented, is just gonna continue to accelerate uh, the expansion of our, our market and our industry uh, again, because we're really competing uh, on price more than anything else now. No, I, I sure appreciate this conversation. Everyone knows that I cut everyone off on time and I let you go five minutes longer, which Thank I never do. <laughs> so I, I, I really think this is important for all of us as we get ready for our Investing in Energy Futures Conference. But I want to talk to you also about what this means in a global market and get your reflections on Texas. So we'll be sure to have you back if you're willing. I would love and it. And thank you so much for being part of this conversation and have a good rest of your week. And I know I've already been getting little texts about, is this going to be available online? Yes, it will be on the YouTube channel. And um, we'll flip to upcoming events that are happening now. And Josh, thank you so much. This is really fantastic. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So everybody have a good rest of your day and um, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.